Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Mia. We're going to turn to the first giving of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. I'm not going to reread it because it's the same, but will you turn with me to Exodus 20, and this morning we're looking at verses 8 through to verse 11. Let me pray. Father, we do pray that as we have just sung, that you will indeed still our souls. Lord, for all of us it's been a busy week. And there are so many hundreds of things that we've been involved in that our minds have been so consumed with the things around us. We pray, Lord, that by your Spirit you may focus our thoughts, our minds, that we may hear God's Word, that we may hear God's voice as we read the Bible. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen. Now we're going to go a little bit over time this morning, which I'm sure you'll understand with our spotlight on love trust. Let me remind you again of the purpose of the Ten Commandments, which really are given to us in verse 1 and 2. Always important when we look at any passage in the Bible that we understand the context, that we understand the passage and the chapter, and we understand the context of that particular verse or that particular paragraph. And that's why I do encourage you to bring your Bibles with you on a Sunday. You may have it on your smartphone, you may have it in a written form, uh, but do bring your Bibles with you because all I do, my job, is to unpack the Word of God. I am to teach the Bible. And so it's very helpful if you can bring your Bibles with you and uh, we can study God's word together. But we need to understand the context, and especially the context of the Ten Commandments. So notice again verse 1 and 2, just so that we don't get, get, uh, get the commandments wrong. Chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So you may remember that in the Old Testament, the exodus is seen as a picture or a metaphor of the gospel of salvation, that God rescued the nation of Israel from slavery, from oppression. He rescued them from Egypt. He took them through the blood of the Lamb, through the Red Sea, and he rescued them so that they may enter the promised land. So the Old Testament often regards the exodus the historical event of the Exodus, as a picture of salvation, as a picture of the gospel. So now Moses, as he gives us the Ten Commandments, and then 40 years later he gave it in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the same Ten Commandments, he's telling God's people who have been rescued, who have been saved, who have been saved from oppression and persecution and slavery. He's saying, now that I have saved you, now that you are a saved, redeemed people, this is how you ought to live as a redeemed people. Now, for us who live after the New Testament, we not only look back at the Exodus, but we also look back to the cross of Christ and to Christ himself who came to die for us, a substitutionary atonement. And so for us, it's the cross, it's Christ that has saved us. We are rescued not by the Ten Commandments, not by obeying them, not by trying to make ourselves better. No, we are saved by Christ. We are saved by the cross of Christ, the blood of Christ. And now as God's saved people, God's redeemed people, this is how we ought to live. The Ten Commandments still apply to us today. 
You have them fleshed out by Jesus in the Gospels, by the apostles in the letters. So what God is saying, he's not saying that if you obey the Ten Commandments, you will become a Christian or you will go to heaven. No, you are saved through Christ. You are saved through the cross. As saved people, as redeemed people, this is now how you ought to live. Now, you've probably seen over the last couple of weeks how the commandments are clear. They are simple, but they're not simplistic. There is a depth to them. And as we saw last week and the previous weeks, that there's a depth, there's an extraordinary depth to each of the commandments. So remember, we looked at verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Well, it's not just a physical image, it's not just a physical idol, it's also a mental image. You can't think of God as you like. You can't worship God as you like. You can't approach God as you like. No, God has given us instructions. He's given us a template as to how we are to think of him, how we are to approach him. So that command is more than just a physical image. It's also a wrong mental image that we may have. Last week, Royden looked at verse 7, the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now, as we saw last week, there is a depth to that commandment. It's not just taking the name of the Lord in vain. It has many other implications. So, for instance, if you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, but you live like a non-Christian, you're actually taking the name of the Lord in vain. So it's not just using God's name as a swear word or as punctuation. No, it's also calling yourself a Christian, and yet when you're at the office, when you're at home, when you're mixing with other people, you live like a non-Christian. Well, you are breaking the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So this morning, we're also going to look at the Sabbath, and we'll see how that affects our daily lives. But we'll also see a little bit later on the depth of it, that it's actually pointing us to something more than just a day or just a rest. There's more to it. So stay with me because we want to unpack the whole commandment. And in particular, we want to see the richness of this idea of Sabbath and of a rest. Now, let's read again chapter 20 from verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Now, when you first read that commandment, as has just been read to us by Mia, we kind of focus on the word Sabbath, but actually it's not only talking about the Sabbath or rest. And by the way, those two words are used interchangeably in the Bible. Sabbath is rest. Rest is the Sabbath. But it's not only talking about rest. You'll notice in verse 9, it's also talking about work. So you'll notice verse 9, six days you shall labor and do all your work. So it emphasis, emphasizes both on work and on rest. So let's have a look at this fourth commandment under two main headings. We're going to have a look at work, and then we're going to have a look at rest. So let's dig in straight away and have a look at work. Let me start off by saying that I think most Christians have a misunderstanding because they think of life more like an orange than a peach. Have you got that misunderstanding? I think most people have that misunderstanding. They think of the Christian life more like an orange than a peach. Now, an orange, as you know, you can divide into different segments, and you eat them in different segments, hopefully. A peach is not like that. A peach is a whole peach. You can't eat it in segments. Now, our problem is this. We think of the Christian life in segments. We think certain things are more spiritual than other things. So we think certain segments are more spiritual. Things like church, like prayer, like Bible reading. Things like your marriage, your family. Those are really spiritual things. But the rest is unspiritual. Those are unspiritual segments. Now, my dear friends, that is a false dichotomy. All of life ought to be spiritual. 
God is concerned about all your life. So we often think it's church that's spiritual and Bible study which is spiritual, but my work, it, well, it's not that spiritual, or school, or studies, or sport, or music. The Bible doesn't make that distinction. The Bible says all of life is spiritual. There's no sacred, secular distinction. So Paul tells us in, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, you may just want to note this down, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Paul says, whatever you do, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Whatever you do. So we are all called to be full-time Christians. Isn't that right? We're full-time Christians. So we're Christians 24-7, which means that everything is spiritual. Everything matters. Paul says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. So we've kind of forgotten the theology of vocation. What does that mean? God has given every, each one of us gifts and talents. He's placed us in different situations by his providence. And he expects us to be Christians wherever we are. Whatever job you have, whatever gift or talent you have, whatever opportunity you have, wherever you find a job, it may not be a very exciting job, but God is saying, I have placed you there at this time to serve me. And Paul says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. So the Christian life is not like an orange. There are not certain segments that are spiritual and other segments that are unspiritual. There are not certain segments that are sacred and other segments that are secular. No, all of life is spiritual. And that's why this commandment is dealing with all of life, both work and rest. God is concerned about every aspect of your life. Now turn with me to Genesis 1 and 2. We're going to spend some time in Genesis 1 and 2 because here we find the foundations and the framework to understand the whole idea of work and rest. Genesis chapter 1, as you know, God is creating this world and he does so in different stages. But what I want you to notice is that in Genesis 1, God is represented as a worker. God works in Genesis 1. Work is clearly something he chooses to do. So chapter 1, God acts, God speaks, God creates, God works. He's represented as, as a worker. And after each step of creation, notice verse 10, he says, it is good. Not only the creation he has created, but the act of creating. Verse 12, it is good. Notice verse 31. He comes to the end of day 6. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So we see God right here in Genesis chapter 1. God is represented as a worker. And we see the same thing in the Gospels. God the Son is represented as a worker. So God the Son, within Jewish culture, you would start working with your father. His father, Joseph, was a carpenter, which could be also translated a builder. So he was in construction. He was involved using his hands. So we have the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, not a philosopher, not some royalty riding in some carriage. No, he's working with his hands, probably for 16, 17 years. He was in construction. He was a builder. He was a carpenter. So the Bible is quite clear that both God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit in different ways, are workers. And Jesus was a manual worker. So those of us who are white-collar workers, we need to be careful not to look down on people who are so-called blue-collar workers or people who do manual labor. There's nothing wrong with manual labor. That's what Jesus did for 16, 17 years, and it had value, it had dignity. So what that means, which is a very important principle, is that the Bible gives value and meaning to work. There's a dignity when we work. If God is a worker, if God chooses to work, then it adds value and dignity and meaning to work in and of itself. It's not just a means to an end. It's not just a means to fund 
and to, and to bankroll your weekends. It's not just there to pay the bills. Of course it is that. But work in and of itself is spiritual. It has value. It has dignity. Now, what is quite interesting is that the context in which we find, especially Jesus in the Gospels, was a Greek culture and a Greek worldview. And in the Greek worldview, work was seen as being bad. Work was something which only slaves did. So interesting, the whole Greek pantheon of gods, I think there were 10 or 12, they were all exempt from work because work was cursed. And no noble being and certainly no god would be involved in work. In fact, Socrates said, I quote, he said, work carries a social stigma and is rightly dishonored in our culture. It can damage the body, which in turn damages the soul. Well, perhaps that's how you feel this morning. <laughs> if you do, you are following Greek culture. In total contrast, the Bible represents God the Father, God the Son as workers, as having value. Now, what does it mean to all of us? Well, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 tells us that we are made in the image of God, male and female. He created them in his image. Now, if God is a worker, if we are made in the image of God, then, of course, work is part of our nature. It's part of our intrinsic being. It's part of our humanity. It's what distinguishes us from the animals. Chapter 2, verse 15, Genesis 2, verse 15 Here's a verse, this should be the, the, um, the patron verse for all gardeners. Notice what happens, chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him, in, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So God delegates responsibility to man to manage creation, to take care of the garden. Chapter 2 occurs before chapter 3. Chapter 3 is the fall. Sin enters the picture. Brokenness enters the picture. But work is there before sin arrives. Work is part of our humanity. It's part of what makes us human. So let me draw out one or two implications from that. The first is that work gives us purpose and meaning. And when I talk about work, I'm talking about people who go to school, people who are studying, I'm talking about people who do unpaid voluntary service. I'm talking about housewives or, or house fathers who are looking after their homes and their children and their family. That is hard work. It's jolly hard work. So when we talk about work, all of that is included. It's not just being at the office from 8 to 5. Now, the reason that work gives us purpose and meaning is because God is a worker. And we are made in the image of God. And so part of our purpose, part of our meaning in life, part of the reason we get up Monday morning, as painful as that may be, is it gives us purpose and meaning. Because that's how God created us. Now, there may be someone here this morning who differs with me. You would like an endless holiday. You would like an end to Monday mornings. Well, let me tell you, with respect, you are wrong because weekends and holidays only have meaning because there's work at either end. You only have to speak to someone who's been retrenched, who's unemployed, to find out how depressed you can get when there's no Monday morning to work. Because work gives us purpose, it gives us meaning, it's part of our humanity. The second comment is what, what we picked up earlier earlier on, that, that all of life is spiritual. So Paul is speaking in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Jot that down. He's speaking to slaves and masters. He's speaking to Bible teachers and young Christians. He's speaking to parents and children. He's speaking to white collar, blue collar. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for me. Now, that gives meaning to our day-to-day -day lives. So I don't know about your work, but most work is sort of ordinary. It's sort of small things. 
it's normally not very exciting. Um, I mean, that's what work is. You've got to do that contract, you've got to have that meeting, you've got to manage that situation. Sometimes it's painful. But what God is saying is, it matters. It matters what you do. It matters how you perform it. It is not spiritual because while you're doing it, you're thinking of God. No, you shouldn't be thinking of God. You should, should be thinking of that meeting, dealing with that person, dealing with that problem. But you're doing it for the Lord. And he's saying it matters. What you do tomorrow matters. It may be painful, but it matters. You're doing it unto the Lord. We are 24-7 Christians. We are all full-time Christians. You're not just a Christian over weekends. It gives meaning to the mundane and the ordinary things that we all have to do every day. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said the work of, it, it's so clear, he puts it this way. He says the work of Beethoven and the work of a cleaning lady become spiritual on precisely the same conditions. That of being offered to God, of being done humbly as to the Lord. So whether you're Beethoven or whether you're a cleaning lady, it is spiritual because you're doing it to the Lord. That's what makes it spiritual. I mean, isn't that a wonderful quote? That it doesn't have to be the, the exotic and the things that everybody notices. Most things we do, no one notices. But it matters. If you're, a, if you're a housewife, you're a mother, you spend hours and hours looking after your children, caring for your family, looking after the home, doing it day after day after day after day, the same thing. What the Bible is saying, it matters. It gives dignity to what you are doing when you do it to the Lord. So there we have the word work. Let's now have a look at the word rest. And let's stay in Genesis 2, where we not only have a God who works, but we have a God who rests. So we need to see that. Genesis 2, verse 1 to 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So the picture that Moses gives us, Moses was the author of the first five books of the Bible, the picture that Moses gives us is that we here have not only a God who works, but a God who rests. He rests from his creative activity. So God draws a boundary between work and rest. And once again, as with the principle with work, so with the principle with rest. If we are made in the image of God, we also need to draw a boundary between work and rest. Neither work nor rest are complete in and of themselves. Each needs the other. Each takes meaning from the other. Both work and rest. Now let me draw out three quick implications. Number one, the Bible makes it quite clear, especially Paul in Romans chapter 14, that it's not the actual day that matters. Uh, that certainly seems to be the case within the Old Testament, but Paul tells us that it's not the actual day, the actual 24 hours that matters. It's the principle that matters. That God in his goodness, in the created order, has said that one out of seven needs to be a day of rest. Do you know that communism in the early days, in the 1920s, 1930s, because they wanted more productivity from their people, they created a 10-day week. You work for nine days and you get one day rest. And do you know that their productivity went down to such an extent that they came back to what they didn't realize was God's principle? One out of seven. Now, that'll be different days for different people because we have different circumstances. It's not the actual day which is sacred. No, it's the principle. So if you were planting a church in Israel, I would think, or New York, uh, Jewish, they're both Jewish. Um, uh, um, that was supposed to be a joke, but anyway. <laughs> so if you were... 
doing Christian work in Israel, I would think that you would have church on a Saturday because that's when the whole culture has a rest. I think if you're working in a Muslim country, I think you would have church on a Friday because that's when the whole culture comes to an end. It's not the actual day. There's a legalism in saying that particular day. No, in Romans 14, Paul tells us quite clearly there's no sacred days. In fact, all days belong to God. The second thing is that work can become an idol. Now, of course, anything can become an idol, including leisure. So for some of us, uh, I mean, you meet these people around the, around the uh, coffee trolley, and uh, Monday to Wednesday, all they talk about is what happened over the weekend. And then Thursday and Friday, all they talk about is what is going to happen the next weekend. <laughs> so, so they're really just working to fund and to bankroll their weekends, which actually means their weekends, their leisure, can become their idol. But I suspect that the greatest danger of idolatry in this room is not leisure, but work that we become workaholics. We live in Joburg, of course, and that's why we're here. Now, let me give you some tests as to whether you are a workaholic. So check yourself. Tick the boxes. A workaholic is someone who lives to work. That's the meaning, the purpose of their lives. A workaholic is someone who defines themselves by their work, by their status, by their success, by their money. So they don't define themselves that I'm married. They don't define themselves that I'm in Christ. No, they define themselves by their job, their job description, their status, their success, their money. A workaholic is someone where marriage comes second, family comes second, church comes second, leisure comes second. A workaholic is someone who is unable to relax, unable to take a week off or a day off, or take a holiday. In fact, they feel guilty if they're not working. Now, my dear friend, if that is true of you, and let me admit that sometimes that's true of me, we need to recognize that your work has become an idol. You define yourself in terms of your work. You recognize that work is the most important thing. So we need to recognize this is an idol. We need to recognize that there's much more to life than work. We need to recognize that, that we need time with our family. We need time to worship. We need time to be at church. We need time for leisure. We need time just to have a break from all the normal activities that we're involved in. We need to recognize that our identity is not from my work or my image or my status or my title or my money. No, my identity is found in Christ. When you take a day of rest, it means that you are actually saying to God, I trust you that you will provide for me even though I'm not working this day. A third implication, and here we're going to dig deeper. Sabbath or rest is actually the goal of life. Let me say that again. Sabbath or rest, it's the same word, is the goal of life. Now have a look again at chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, and I'm going to read it again. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So the sixth day of creation, which you get at the end of chapter 1, the sixth day was the creation of man, male and female. That was the apex, that was the pinnacle of God's creation, but not the end point. The end point of creation, the purpose of creation, was day 7. Rest. Sabbath. So the ultimate goal of creation is rest. You see, there's no eighth day of creation. It's the idea of fullness, of completeness, of wholeness. It's the idea of total joy, total satisfaction, that God, his creation, his creatures are in perfect harmony, which is really what we see in Genesis 2. Genesis 2 happens before Genesis 3, the fall. 
There's harmony, unity between the husband and his wife. All things seem pleasing to the eye. There's harmony between God and man as God walks with them in the cool of the evening. It's really a picture of heaven. Perfect relationship between man and woman, between men and men and woman and woman, between the creature and the creator, between the creature and creation. It's a picture of heaven. That's the ultimate rest. That's the ultimate Sabbath. There's fullness, there's perfect fullness found when we rest in God. So the word Sabbath throughout the Old and New Testament, it's the same principle, but it's fleshed out in different ways. So interesting that here in Genesis 2, it's speaking of a day, and in most of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, it's meant a day. But in Exodus 23, Sabbath is used for the seventh year in which you rest your fields. That's why we use the word a sabbatical, which is meant to be one year. I only got three months. Um, (laughs) So it's not just a day, it's a year. In Deuteronomy 7, the Sabbath, the, the word Sabbath isn't used of a day or a year. It's used of the land of Canaan, where there's rest from your enemies. In Psalm 95, they are in the land of Canaan, in the promised land, and Sabbath is for God's future, with God's people, which is future. So it's even more profound than a day, a year, or land. No, it's something future. Mark chapter 2, verse 28, Jesus states categorically that he, the Son of Man, is the Lord of the Sabbath, meaning he has come to usher in the true Sabbath, the true rest for God's people, which is a right relationship with God, which is resting in God, which is heaven. And then finally, turn with me to Matthew 11, verse 28, Very important that we turn to this verse because it really brings it, brings clarity to the whole issue of Sabbath. Matthew 11, verse 28. Here's Jesus speaking once again. Notice what he says, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. No, it says, I will give you rest. It's the same word. So where do we find rest? Where do we find Sabbath? We ultimately find it in Christ. Christ is our Sabbath. We get rest from our labors, rest from sin, rest from our striving, rest from the struggles of living in this broken world with broken bodies. We finally find freedom. We find rest. We find wholeness. Fullness. You see, when we are in heaven, we are resting in Christ. And he is the ultimate fulfillment of the Sabbath. So let me close and say the deeper lesson of the fourth commandment is that it's not just a day of rest, and it is. That is a principle. That's a creation principle God has given us. If you don't rest, you're not going to make it. And God has given us this this rhythm, this pattern. But it's more than that. It's more than just a day or a year or land. No, it's the goal of creation. It's where creation is heading. Rest. Christ. Being in Christ in heaven. Where we come to an end of our work, of our striving, of our struggles, of our sins, and we rest in Christ. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath. Rest. Now, we sometimes use that verse when we under pressure and we are weary and heavy laden, and we use that verse. I think wrongly so. There are other verses that tell us that we can come to, to the Lord whenever we are in need or weary or heavy laden. But this verse is telling us that Christ is our rest. Christ is our Sabbath. So what that tells us is that life is more than work. Life is more than this world. There's more to life than money and possessions and things. 
and status and titles. No, true life, true life, true freedom, true rest, true wholeness is found in Christ, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of rest, the Lord of fullness, the Lord of wholeness, the Lord of completeness. So if you're looking for satisfaction, final satisfaction, in created things or other creatures, you are going to be terribly disillusioned because they will never provide it. It can only be found in the Creator, who is our ultimate rest and our ultimate Sabbath. Let me close. I've said that twice. You know when a preacher says, let me close, don't believe it. Okay? When he says finally, don't believe it. Okay, finally, finally. Here's a, here's, a, here's a great quote, and then I'll pray. C.S. Lewis, you know this quote, it's such a wonderful quote. C.S. Lewis says, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Well, let's pray. Father, we do pray that you will forgive us when we have tried to find rest in the things of this world, in our work, in our leisure, in our money, in our achievements, in all the stuff we have. Forgive us. Convict us, Lord, that we may enjoy your blessings but not see them as the ultimate source of joy and wholeness and fullness and rest. So, Father, write these truths upon our hearts that the purpose of our lives may not be something temporary and transient that will disintegrate, but that our purpose may be found in Christ the only place you can find ultimate rest. So, Father, go with us into this week. Help us to serve you in all that we do, to do everything as unto the Lord. And we pray this for Christ's sake. Amen.